The Trinity is a belief that God is one, only one God, and three in persons. In other words, one being or one what. There's one what. He's God. What I am is a human being. What God is is a divine being, God. There's one what. But there are three persons, three who's. A being is that which makes you what you are. A person is that which makes you who you are. So what am I? I'm a human being. Who am I? I'm Nabil. Those are two separate things, what I am and who I am. In the same way, God is one what and three who's. It's not a contradiction. And so this is why when Muslims say one plus one plus one equals one, how does that work? It's like, no, those are apples and oranges. One plus one plus one are the persons, one being. Uh, and when Christians respond with, no, one times one times one equals one, that doesn't even make any sense. So don't even, don't do that. <laughs> so the question that we now have to ask is, can God come into this world? I want to discover God together. I want to understand who he can be together. The first question I want to ask is, can God, if he so chooses, come into this world? Now, remember what we just talked about with Tawheed. There's a lot of disagreement throughout Islamic history and even today on Tawheed. Let's talk about the Old Testament version of this issue. Let's talk about what the Old Testament says because that's what Christianity is built on, Judaism. So what does the Old Testament have to say? Can God come into the world? The answer is yes, many times over, yes. God comes in the garden with Adam. Jacob wrestles with God. God calls out from a bush. He shows up as a pillar of fire and cloud. God appears to the elders, Exodus says, and also God walks in front of Moses. There are many examples. These are just the first few books of the Old Testament and what I found in those. So can God come into this world? The answer is, in the laha ala kulli sha'in kadir. God is able to do anything that he wants to do. Can that one God be complex? Now, we're going back to the issue of who God is. Even in Islam, he is very, very complex. We can't understand his nature. Now, within the Old Testament, is that so? The first time we see God introduced in the Old Testament is the very first verse of the Old Testament. The word God is Elohim. Okay, but notice, the word Elohim is plural. Technically, we translate this word gods. However, the verse treated that word as if it were singular. So it's plural and singular at the same time from the very first verse of the Old Testament. There are actually four examples of, of this pluriform God in Genesis chapter one. I can't go into all, but one more that I wanna to go to is Genesis 1.26, same chapter, four examples, this is the second. It's that God says, let us make man in our image. Now you might say, well that's just majestic talk. God is just being majestic. Gleason Archer has pointed out that never in the Hebrew Bible does that way of using the word us ever get used in a form of majesty. God is saying something about himself. He's plural and yet singular. Now the most common response to this, and one I've heard Dr. Ali give the most in his talks, is what about the Shema? This is like the Jewish Shahada. This is Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Doesn't that say, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one? Well, that's one translation of it. What it can also say is, hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh alone. And in fact, that is one of the Hebrew translations used today, even among Jews. Now note, the word echad is an interesting word. Whenever the Bible wants to talk about something that is one and has multiple components in that one, it uses the word echad. Follow me, this is extremely important. If God wants to say, I am one and plural, the word he would use is echad. How do we know that? Let's look at these examples. Genesis 1.5 is one example. Let's look at Genesis 2.24. It says, man and woman will become one. The one word, the word one there is echad. Man, woman, two people will become one echad. Numbers 13.23, a single cluster of grapes, many different grapes making one cluster is echad. That's what the word echad means. Now there is a perfectly good word for one and one alone in Hebrew, and that's yechid. For example, in Judges, she was his one and only child, Yechid. Jeremiah, mourn as if for an only son, Yechid. So if 
Yahweh wanted to say, I am one in one alone, he would have used the word yachid. But if he wanted to say, I am one in plural in my unity, he would use the word echad. And that's exactly what we see him as having used. So we're introduced to a God who can be potentially complex. He refers to himself in the plural. And then we start seeing this. This is fascinating. I want you to watch this very carefully. In Genesis chapter 18, it says that Yahweh appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre near Sodom and Gomorrah. Yahweh appeared. So this is another one of those examples where God appears as a man. Then in verse 1924, look at this. It says, now here's Yahweh about to rain fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, Yahweh rained on Sodom and Gomorrah from Yahweh out of heaven. Think about this. Yahweh, who's appeared as a man, is raining fire from Yahweh in heaven. And the Hebrew here actually says Yahweh twice. This isn't a bad translation of the Hebrew. What does this mean? Well, we know the Jews only believe in one God. How can Yahweh be there and here? Now, is this just Nabil's interpretation of the Old Testament? Is this just a weird thing I'm doing with the text? Look at Amos chapter 4, verse 11. I overthrew you as Elohim overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, declares Yahweh. Even the Old Testament realizes that Yahweh declares that Yahweh overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. There are two, but we know there's only one God. Take a look at Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. In that context, sitting at the hand, right hand of God is like ruling the universe with God. And it says, the Lord said to my Lord. Once again, we see that there's almost as if there are two gods, but we know there's only one God. The Old Testament is very clear about that. This is one that I definitely want you to grasp. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. Daniel sees the Ancient of Days, who is the Father, God. He sees God, and then he says in verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came even to the Ancient of Days and was brought near before him. Okay, so here's the Ancient of Days, and there's one who looks like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. Deuteronomy 33 tells us only Yahweh comes on the clouds. But here's Son of Man coming on the cloud. So already we should be thinking, wait a minute, these are two God figures. And then verse 14 says this, And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. Wait a minute. To the Son of Man is given glory over heaven? That's what it says. And it says the people of every nation and language will serve him. This word serve is used over 130 times in the Bible. Every time it's used is used to denote a service due to God alone. And here it's being given to one who looks like a son of man. So it looks like once again we have God the Father and we have this other kind of divine being who's called one who looks like a son of man. Here's the point I want to make to you. The earliest Christian records proclaim that that Yahweh came into this earth. It's something he has done before and he's going to do it. We're promised he will do it in Isaiah 9, 6. This is what Mark's gospel has to say about Jesus. Mark 1, verse 3. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now Isaiah is saying Jesus is coming, prepare the way of the Lord. Look in Isaiah 40, verse 3. Clear the way for Yahweh in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Mark takes the word Yahweh and puts Jesus in that very same context. He's equating Jesus to Yahweh. Mark 2.28 says, The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Well, the Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. When Jesus says he's Lord of the Sabbath, he's saying he's Lord of the Ten Commandments. Once again, Mark is giving Jesus a prerogative of Yahweh alone. In Mark 4.38, the disciples were on a boat caught in a storm, and they called out to Jesus in their trouble, and he delivered them and made the storm to be still. Look at Psalm 107. God's people are on a boat, caught in a storm, and they called out to Yahweh in their trouble, and he delivered them and made the storm to be still. Mark is taking Yahweh out and putting Jesus in. In Mark 14, 62, when Jesus is asked who he is, he gives a trifold response. We're going to focus on the second parts. He says, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. What does this remind you of? The two verses from the Old Testament where it looked like there are two divine figures. The one sitting at the right hand of the power, co-ruler over the universe, and the one coming on the clouds of heaven, who comes only as God would come, is given only the divine prerogatives of God, and served worship by all people for all time. Jesus says, you remember those passages which had two Yahwehs? One of them is me. <laughs> 
And this is why they picked up, or they said, crucify him, because he was claiming to be God. Look, this isn't just found in Mark's gospel. Here's the other point that I want to make to Dr. Shabira Lee. Every single earliest record we have in the New Testament portrays Jesus as Yahweh. The Carmen Christi of Philippians 2 is one of the earliest records we have of Christian history. It's an insight into the time before the New Testament was written, right after Jesus was resurrected. What does it do? In verses 10 and 11, it says, to Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Where do they get that from? Isaiah 45, where it says, to Yahweh, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Even before Mark's gospel, people are taking Yahweh's name and putting it in with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we see Paul, and, and, and sorry, this is actually pre-Pauline, as Bart Ehrman would argue, he does argue in his new book. The earliest, even before Paul, even before Mark, Christians took the Shema, Shema Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, took that and divided that up between two, the Father and the Son, and that's what 1 Corinthians 8, 6 is. Why does this matter? I've got just over a minute to explain why all of this matters. The first thing I want to explain to you is that the Trinity is the best explanation for who God is, the best explanation of the biblical data. It's the best explanation of what God has been doing from the time of Adam and Moses and onwards through Jesus. But also I want to say that intimacy with God is the most important, noble pursuit we could ever have. To know that God is a God of true Love. Why does this matter? Love is the root of all things we consider good. Look at the names of Allah that we, that we were taught. He's Ar-Rahman, he's Ar-Rahim, he's Al-Wadud. What are these things? They're all relational terms about love, self-sacrifice, graciousness, mercy. What do these things have in common? They all come from love. And the reason why that matters is because according to the Islamic view, the monadic view of Allah, Allah cannot in his essence be love. And why not? Because in eternity past, there was nothing for Allah to love. He could only become loving once he created people. Something to love. So his love is contingent upon his creation. He can't in his essence be love. Whereas the Christian God, from eternity past, is loving within the community of three persons in the Trinity. And it's out of that love that the Father had for the Son that he creates people in the Son's image to populate this world. And he sends us into this world to love this world as the Son loved this world, to be willing even to die for the sake of those who are hurting and suffering. That is what the Christian message is. Love is at the heart of mankind, and it's because we've been made in the image of a triune God. 